Welcome to Bon Hill Geography. Today we're going to be looking at Typhoon Haiyan. We've got a short summary alongside the primary, secondary effects, the immediate and long-term responses. These are in some of your slides at the end of the PowerPoint. In addition to this, we do also have some model answers, but I do advise you try them before you go straight forward to the models. Enjoy today's video. Typhoon Haiyan struck the Philippines in November 2013, leaving behind a trail of destruction in its wake. The main area affected was Tacloban, as you can see in the picture behind us. With wind speeds up to 195 miles per hour, it became one of the strongest tropical storms ever recorded. Let's have a look at those primary effects. Socially, over 6,300 people lost their lives. Most of them drowned in the storm surge, which was a secondary effect, so we'll touch more on that later. In Tacloban, 40,000 homes were damaged or destroyed. This left over 600,000 people displaced. In total, it's estimated that 90% of the city was destroyed. Entire communities were wiped out and many families were left homeless. This led to large-scale migration away from the coast for a short period of time. Economically, the typhoon destroyed 30,000 fishing boats and caused widespread damage to infrastructure, including the Tacloban Airport Terminal. Hospitals, shops and schools were also destroyed. This disrupted livelihoods and education, potentially locking people in to the cycle of poverty in the future. In total, the typhoon left 6 million people without a source of income and caused a significant blow to the country's economy, with the total economic damages estimated at $14 billion. Environmentally, flooding brought 400 millimetres of rain. This caused landslides and blocked many roads, potentially blocking further aid from getting towards cities that needed it in the future. The storm's strong winds also destroyed crops and damaged power lines, while coastal areas suffered extensive damage both to marine and land habitats. Let's now look at the secondary effects. Remember, these are the knock-on effects that occur because of the primary effects. In the background behind us, we can see a really good example of the secondary effects of the storm surge. This amplified the suffering, particularly with the creation of this. Look at the low tide, the normal sea level, so mean sea level and high tide. Look how much higher up the storm surge is expected to be. So even homes that were prepared with uh, them being on stilts could not withstand the full force of the water. Socially, shortages of food, water and shelter led to outbreaks of disease, particularly cholera that hospitals now destroyed struggled to treat. In Tacloban, looting and violence broke out as people struggled to survive. Power supplies in some areas were cut off for up to a month. This deepened the hardship. Economically, the destruction of the fishing boats and coconut plantations crippled key industries that many areas in the Philippines depended on for a stable income. Surprisingly, rice farming and fishing were actually quickly re-established, mainly thanks to international aid, though coconut production, which take year, took years to recover, faced long-term challenges. Roads blocked by landslides further delayed aid and economic recovery. Environmentally, oil spills from damaged ships polluted coastal waters. This further harmed marine ecosystems, already devastated by the storm surge. This even destroyed things like uh, coral reefs and fish nurseries. The storm surge also destroyed forests and mangroves near the coasts. These were natural defences, so it meant that they were less resilient for any future disasters that could occur. So what was done to help immediately? Remember this can be in the short term before, during or very shortly after the event. There were significant numbers of social and humanitarian efforts. Over 1,200 evacuation centres were set up for the homeless and international aid agencies, including Oxfam, delivered food, water and temporary shelters, trying to find homes for the 600,000 people that had lost them. French, Belgian and Israeli field hospitals treated the injured, while the Philippines Red Cross distributed basic food aid. The UK government sent 1,000 shelter kits to assist displaced families and international governments pledged one, well, billions of pounds in significant aid. The US, for example, plied, uh, supplied $87 million in disaster relief, while Australia contributed $28 million. It's important to remember that the total cost for this disaster was $14 billion. As a result, 
they are still very much on the back foot and recovering even today. Japan sent emergency supplies and a medical team, and the European Union allocated 20 million for recovery efforts. These helicopters were sent with the to distribute aid were absolutely essential, but we'll talk more about those in a minute. Aid agencies replaced fishing boats. This ensured communities could regain their primary source of income, with many people in the primary sector. US aircraft carrier George Washington assisted with search and rescue operations. These brought vital amounts of helicopters and airplanes. These were able to supply drop all the isolated areas that had been cut off due to landslides inland. Without these efforts from the US, the death toll would have been significantly higher. The total amount of monetary aid that the Philippines received was about $1.5 billion. This was $12.5 billion short of what they experienced in damages. So what were the long-term responses? Remember, these are any actions taken in the weeks, months, or even years after the event itself. Social recovery. Thousands of homes were rebuilt away from high-risk flood areas. More cyclone shelters were constructed to protect communities in future disasters. International donors supported new livelihood opportunities, helping families to rebuild their lives. Economically, the Philippines focused efforts on reconstructing roads, bridges and airport facilities to restore economic activity and, importantly, bring in investment into the country where possible. The UK government sent shelter kits for families and foreign donors like the EU provided financial support for sustainable development. Environmentally, programmes were implemented to restore mangroves and other natural defences. Remember, these naturally slow down the impact of storm surges. In many areas, these had already been chopped down to make way for more space for housing. Now, seeing their folly, the Philippines have decided to replant many of these areas. This not only repaired the damaged ecosystems themselves, which also, as a result, improved fish stocks, but also enhanced resilience against future storms. But with the effectiveness of the responses, it might leave you asking, why were the effects so devastating? One of the deadliest aspects of Typhoon Haiyan was the storm surge. This reached heights of up to 7 metres. A lack of accurate predictions and insufficient early warnings meant that many residents underestimated the threat and did not evacuate. Thousands of lives were lost as people stayed in vulnerable areas, unaware of the need to evacuate to higher ground. Additionally, the cheapest land in the Philippines is right next to the coast. These homes were poorly built and they suffered the worst damage. They were constructed with lightweight materials and lacked proper reinforcements. These structures were no match for the typhoon's powerful winds and surging waters. The devastation of the Philippines underscores the importance of enforcing building codes and relocating vulnerable communities to safer areas. Here we see a really good example of a house that did follow building code and was not destroyed while around it we can see utter devastation. Improving storm surge prediction, investing in de disaster resistant infrastructure and raising awareness about evacuation protocols are critical steps to prevent such a tragedy from ever happening again. Typhoon Haiyan was a stark reminder of the immense power of nature and the vulnerability of many human communities around the world. But it also demonstrated the resilience of the Filipino people and the power of global solidarity with everybody working together to fight against future disasters. As we face the increasing threat of climate change, lessons from Haiyan highlight the importance of preparedness, sustainable recovery and international cooperation. On the next two slides you'll find summaries of everything that's been discussed in today's lesson. On the next slide is an example of a model answer for this question. Please do watch my nine mark question guide if you are struggling to answer them in your exams. This question says assess the effectiveness of strategies used to reduce the impacts of tropical storms, which is nine marks and three spec. On the next slide we have a model answer which uses an alternative strategy to three paragraphs and instead uses two and a conclusion. Have a look and see what you think.
These are most of the tropical storm questions that we have experienced throughout the latest exam series. Please do have a try at answering them and feel free, if you are lucky enough to be taught by me, to hand them in. Thank you for watching.